Hello everyone. Thank you for being with me here tonight with the Bee Guardians Gathering. I'm super excited about talking about um, sacred beekeeping. Um, this was really my, um, what brought me to beekeeping. I didn't know it, um, you know, but this is why the bees came to me. This sacred beekeeping um, is part of my lineage, is part of the lineage of many people across the world. And um, I'm just really excited to be able to talk to you about it tonight. I recently was able to talk about sacred beekeeping at the Mid-South Women's Herbal Conference. And it just really lifted my spirits. And I thought, well, why not talk about it again in the Bee Guardians gathering? Um, really, sacred beekeeping informs everything that, that I do and the way that I work with bees. Um, and so I feel like it's really important to kind of define a little bit more about what that means to me. And I've talked a little bit about it in previous um, courses that we've done, but I just wanted to go a little bit more in depth. And some of this might be a little bit of a review, but um, I really want to speak to why I do the certain things that I do. Um, when I started beekeeping in early 2017, I'd actually been reading about bees for many years before preparing myself. I'm one of those people who likes to research a lot before I, I jump into something. And when I told my, my grandmother that I was going to be, that I was beekeeping and how much I enjoyed it, she actually bought me for my birthday um, The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd. And um, I'll tell you why that's really important on many levels is that I, one of the reasons why I started beekeeping was because I wanted to learn to be more patient and to be more in my body. And I really think that that's sacred. I think that learning to be in our bodies and be in an embodied place um, is sacred. And we lose that sacredness when we step out of our body, when we aren't um, focused on our own feelings and sensations as we work through something. And when my grandmother gave me this book, The Secret Life of Bees, it showed me, well, it really brought me on the spiritual path of beekeeping. And I really appreciate her um, guiding me in that way. And if you haven't read that book, I really highly recommend it. And it's about this um, woman who basically saves this young girl. And this woman is dedicated her beekeeping to the Black Madonna and has the Black Madonna on all of her honey jars. And um, they do a, a ceremony um, during certain feast days and work with um, Mary, Mother Mary. And my grandmother was named Mary, so that really, um, you know, and my mother too. So that really rang a bell for me, but it really set up my foundation of spiritual beekeeping. And so as you know, um, I like to start off all my, my work with bees, all my ceremony, all my beekeeping with a um, bringing us into our bodies breathing exercise. So if you feel called and you want to do this, we're going to take um, three deep breaths in and on the exhale, we're going to hum. And you can close your eyes so that you can really settle into your body and feel that vibration that brings you down into your body. Always makes me feel so much better okay so now let's switch over to the slideshow oh there I am all right 
So, sacred beekeeping is learning from the wisdom of the bee. And we can find throughout history, um, even very early humans, that we've been in relationship with bees. And Dr. Thomas Seeley, who I highly recommend his books, um, Honey Bee Democracy and the Lives of Bees, um, he proposed this theory that when we moved, um, it, when we stopped being nomadic and we became more um, agricultural and we started making gardens and storing grains that we would have these vessels that we held our water in or baskets that we harvest our food in and the bees moved into these baskets and so my theory is that the bees actually chose to be in relationship with us and um, I really think it's cool that bees and humans have been in relationship as long as bees and dogs have been in relationship. So we know at least 10,000 years, maybe even farther back than that. That's just what we can record. And if you have any questions, you can just uh, put them in the chat and I will um, answer them when I, when I can. And if I don't see it, just add it in there again. <laughs> um, and so you can see this image, the, the darker brown image on the right, is an image from Spain and this is either a man or a woman who is climbing on a ladder to to harvest some honey and you can see the bees flying around and you know it, what's really interesting is I recently heard someone saying that this might actually be a map of the the Pleiades which is also known as the beehive cluster and you can also see that it kind of looks like a woman and what she's holding almost looks like a lyre. And, um, you know, that's one of the instruments that was played for bees along with um, the sistrum and the, uh, the, the frame drum. And then we'll move on to the next image, which is looks like a mushroom man with a bee's head and then the antlers of a stag. And this was painted in a cave in northern Africa. And um, this image is about 7,000 years old. And this was found in a cave. And um, bees were thought to be messengers between the worlds. So um, this is also known as the uh, bee shaman because a lot of wisdom keepers, shamans, medicine people actually worked with the spirit of the bee because it was thought that bees would travel between the, the worlds of the living and the dead. And we actually see this reflected in many different cultures, including the, the Catholic Church. Um, up until the 80s, they actually would only use beeswax in the church because they believed that that beeswax um, held the power to bring the prayers up to the heavens. You know, when we blow a candle out and we see the smoke rise, and then when we see these golden bees rise to the heavens. And then there is the um, tradition of telling the bee after someone has passed away. Um, there's actually documented cases of bees um, showing up to their um, beekeepers funeral back when people used to be buried on the land where they were um, living and um, there are several cases of that documented um, but people used to actually drape the hives in um, black cloth when the beekeeper died uh, and told the bees what was happening but the bees were also told when um, a baby was born or someone was married because they believed that the bees were part of the family and if you didn't tell the bees then they might leave they might get upset and another um, kind of Celtic uh, wisdom is one, one of the things that we hear is go ask the wild bee what the druids knew uh, because it was known that the bees are, you know, the great communicators and they're connected to, to all things and connected to other worlds. And then you can see this um, image of um, what's also known as the, the bee goddess on the bottom right. And if you've seen some of my beehives, I have some renditions of the um, mushroom bee shaman and the bee goddess painted on a couple of my hives. 
and this was found in in Greece and um, there's lots of different pendants even this image on my shirt that my bee sister gave me um, is an ancient Minoan um, bee pendant and there were um, the priestesses of these different temples who would um, work with the bees and would um, make basically work with the bees to um, talk between the worlds they worked as oracles and the oracle of delphi was known as the delphic bee the um the uh, or the deborah or the melissa melissa many different um temple priestesses were known as the bee as the the gatekeepers of this wisdom that traveled between the worlds and um, the Egyptians worked very deeply with the bees and the uh, pharaohs actually had beehives you could see on their heads depicted on their heads um, a lot of the pharaohs were actually the head beekeepers um, they would mummify their um, their dead with honey and propolis from the hive um, they used honey a lot in skin care they actually we actually utilize some of the knowledge that the ancient Egyptians discovered still today like the Egyptians discovered that the brood or baby bees are always going to be located at the entrance and so that's one of the things that we know to this day the Egyptians also used migratory beekeeping and so what they would do is have these barges on the Nile River and they would have all their beehives in these clay pots and they would send them down the Nile River as the um, flowers were blooming so um, when they stopped blooming in one area and you know they would go farther north and follow the um, flower the nectar flow which I thought is pretty neat um, and then also another thing that the Egyptians discovered was were that the um, bees are more gentle when um, you smoke them and so we think some of the first incense was from um, bees being smoked for their hives with the Egyptians um, and then the Hindu um, believed that um, Krishna was really connected with the bee and you can see a blue bee on his head in many depictions of him and so many of the Hindu people before they harvest honey they always bring offerings of holy basil um, to the to the bees so make sure that was all I had to say about that I mean I could do a whole class on that so um, Mandy says, I wonder what the hand behind the mushroom bee shaman symbol. Oh, that's from Charlie. The hand symbolizes. Well, that's a really great question. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, in my own head, I feel like that handprint is a, that, so we think about bees and we think about the veils that we wear because that veil designates the different space. And we could say it designates our space and the space outside ourselves. So, the space where bees can get to and the space where they can't and when we're when we're veiled when we're behind the veil we're in one world but can see into another and so I wonder if that hand is showing that space between the two worlds like you know this this is where you know two worlds collide that's my theory I have no idea if that's truly what that means that's just what comes to my head at first and Charlie if you have any Thing that you think that might mean I would really love to to hear your explanation as well or your thoughts so um, I think sacred beekeeping is really an act of love and devotion there we go for the bees and so this hive here on the right is my mother Mary hive and I painted this after I read of the secret life of bees and this is in honor of my grandmother Mary and my mom Mary and then you can see my Mary candle and um oh charlie says maybe a hand in another dimension yeah that's that's kind of what i'm thinking as well so um i think that when we are setting up our beehives and when we are painting them that we designate that as sacred space you know we think about altars that we have in churches or in temple spaces or in our homes and i like to think of the beehive as an altar in itself and that we are guardians of this hive 
And, you know, we do that through being in tune with the, the senses and the seasons. And what I mean by that is when we approach the hive, we're, we're trying to, you know, smell if we smell anything that might be rotten, um, because that might mean we have um, wax moth problem. Um, or we want to notice the entrance of the hive and see how gentle the bees are or if they're kind of in a frenzy or they might be being robbed. And then talking about the seasons, that is so important. And I really feel like the bees really connect us to the seasons because we're thinking about nectar flow. We're thinking about, you know, when the bees are cold and they're in a cluster. Um, and we really don't want to go into the hive when there is no nectar flow because we can set robbing off. So by observing nature and being in tune with the seasons, we are really stepping into that, that sacred act of beekeeping, that acknowledging that, you know, we are humans, but we are no better than the bee. The bee has as much of a right to have its own sacred living space as we do. You know, we wouldn't want someone to, to come and, um, you know, pull the roof of our house off without giving us a little notice. So, you know, I think it's these really slow moving um, practices that we do when we approach the hive, we put our hands on the hive and we hum. Um, actually, before I even do that, I, I talk to them as I'm walking up to the hive so that they know that I am coming in. Um, and, you know, they get used to your smell. That's why it's really important not to wear any sort of like perfumes or strong smelling deodorants or anything like that because that can be offensive to them. And you really want them to get used to your smell so that when you come up to the hive, you know, you, uh, they know who you are, they know what you're going to do, they know you're going to be gentle. And another thing is that after the bees have seen you five times, they can recognize your face. Even if you're through a veil, they can recognize your face. Um, so, you know, they are building a relationship with you, whether you want to recognize it, that or not. They, they understand. Um, yeah, let me make sure that was all. And another really cool thing is you can tell a lot about, you know, if it's going to rain or if it's going to be really cold or a storm is coming by the way that the bees act. And that's through that ob observing. And I have some books I'm going to go through at, towards the end um, to talk about some of these things that we're talking about through here just to be a little bit more of a reference. Okay, um, habitat is really important and um, we want to make sure that we're giving bees a little bit of shade, um, especially if we are in um, hives that are not well insulated. My blue lay-ins hives that you can see there are two inches thick, so that gives them a good insulation and they actually do pretty well in, in full sun. Um, I used to have part shade there, but my landowner came and cut down all the trees this year. So um, we'll see how they do in the full shade this year, but they've been doing, I mean, full sun this year, but they've been doing pretty well so far. Um, and I like to put wood chips underneath all of the hives because that kind of simulates that natural experience that a bee is going to have inside of a, a, a tree because that is their natural habitat is, you know, they are looking for tree hollows that maybe a woodpecker previously lived in or a um, tree was struck by lightning and rotted or a crotch in a tree where, you know, two limbs meet and water, um, pools here and then it rots down you know that that's where bees are making their home so if we can simulate this environment of decaying wood you know that is giving those microbes that the bees need that is giving um, that mushroom mycelium that the bees actually utilize for their immune systems um, they are actually collecting the enzymes that the mushrooms or the mycelium secretes and mycelium or mushrooms are just the fruit of the mycelium mycelium is that white earthy smelling stuff that you see that are in wood chips and on the ground or when you turn over a log and then bees don't live alone they're not the only insect that should be in their hive and so you will in the beehive you should be seeing earwigs and pseudoscorpions and roaches and you know i cannot stand roaches i have had a fear of them since i was a child 
but I have learned to be okay with their presence in the beehive because they are part of that system. And even wax moths, you know, we think, oh, wax moths, they're, they're killing our hive. They're really not killing our hive. Um, typically, if a wax moth takes over, it was probably Varroa that weakened the hive or they had too much space and not big enough of a hive. But what is what the beauty of the wax moth is, they are like the vultures of the bee world. They're going in and cleaning up old comb. And when uh you know, when bees move out of the of a tree that they've lived in or the bees died, the wax moths come and break down all that comb that could be diseased. But this cavity is still good so that another colony can come in and have a clean environment to start over. So I have a newfound, you know, love for wax moths. And then another thing is that we need to provide water for our bees. And this top picture on the top is my little bee waterer. And I actually I have a lot of sticks in there as well. But it's basically just kind of like a little bird bath. And, you know, I see all sorts of native bees drinking from there. Um, we have, like, a cardinal city in our backyard. And so the cardinals come. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers to see a hummingbird there this year. But it's important to put rocks and stones and sticks in there for the bees to land on. They prefer rainwater. So if you have a rain barrel that you can refill it with, I've noticed that they will drink the city water but they um, really like it if it sits there out for a day and kind of lets that chlorine off gas. Um, and then if you, so like at my main bee yard that you can see in the bottom, I use a chicken waterer. That's a five gallon chicken waterer. And then I put gravel in the bottom of it that the bees can land on because I can't go out there every day and refill it. And then another thing is um, when you're doing backyard hives, um, you know, if you have a small backyard, you probably don't want more than two hives in your backyard because we want to make sure that we're not displacing native bees. So it's important for us to have, um, you know, some sort of either home for native bees, whether that be that top left picture that you see there with the little hexagon and the white spots all over it. That's um, a native bee house, and basically all it is is a piece of log with some holes drilled in it. And... You know, you can get one of these, you can buy one. Um, the thing is they need to be, the wood needs to be changed out yearly so that there's not um, any um, disease being spread through there. Um, they sell these really nice little bamboo tubes or cardboard tubes that you can use. Or you can just have decaying wood in your yard or standing dead plant material. It's important to have patches of bare dirt because a lot of our native bees are actually ground nesting bees. Um, but if you're not seeing native bees, then you have too many honeybees. And um, you need to, you know, back off on your honeybees and spread them out to other places. And then, you know, be careful to not spray any pesticides or herbicides because that's going to, um, the, the herbicides are going to affect the gut microbes in the bees. And then the pesticides are going to kill the bees. They're pesticides. All right, that worked on the first click. All right. Okay, so I'm um, just going to briefly go over the, the different designs of the hives because I believe that, you know, in choosing our hive styles, we are also choosing um, the, the ease in which we work with the bees and the type of hives that are better for bees. There is no, you know, like right or wrongness. Um, it's what works best for you. And um, I really feel like, you know, Langstroth hives can really be more bee friendly if we um, work with them in a different way. And Lorenzo Langstroth is the one who came up with the Langstroth hives. And he actually started beekeeping because he was dealing with depression and he was a minister. And I really think that, you know, it's a beautiful story that he recognized that the bees could help him be connected to himself more deeply and to nature more deeply. But what happened throughout the years is um, Langstroth actually designed his hives with two inch thick wood and a, uh, well actually it wasn't two inch thick, it was the boxes with another box that went on top of it. So there was this airspace that provided more insulation. 
And so what we can do now is um, if we have Langstroth hives, which most people do, they're the easiest ones to find, they're the cheapest ones, that you can buy um, nucleus hives really easily if you have these. So I'm not bashing Langstroth hives at all. I have some Langstroth hives. I just don't like lifting 80 pounds of honey. On, they're super heavy. Um, but anyway, you know, we can, by not putting foundation in, which is like plastic. Um, so you can see this picture on the right here with all the different colors. Um, though the lighter color is the baby bees and the darker colors are empty cells. And if you let the bees draw that out themselves and just have an empty frame, rather than putting um, plastic foundation in that frame, that's more bee friendly. Um, by putting up windbreaks around your hives, more bee friendly. Windbreaks can be trees. They, I actually had the trees all, landowner cut down all the trees, so I had to put um, landscaping fabric and tea posts around my hives until I can get some um, trees growing again. But um, in the winter time, you can wrap them in canvas cloth or roofing paper. Um, when you're working the beehives, you see how on this bottom picture it takes the whole roof off of the hive. You can take a piece of canvas cloth and just cover up some of that. That way their entire roof is not exposed. And then I have a lot of people who are always asking me about the, um, the flow hive. And the flow hive, you know, it, it, many people say it's more bee friendly. And, you know, it can be because it's um, more, how do I say, like, less invasive of honey harvesting. But when you um, are having bees in plastic frames, I don't feel like that's more bee friendly. Um, and I really feel like, you know, the bees are going to have it any around 95 degrees um, inside. That's how they keep their babies warm. And um, they're also dehydrating honey. And when, um, I just don't like the idea of heating plastic. And I know that bees don't like plastic. And it also affects their communication from, you know, one frame to the other. The wax and the, the hexagons actually is the perfect geometry for their um, communication. And if you notice a lot of, like, people who are working with sound or, um, like, churches or things like that, have those hexagonal shapes because it the way sound travels through it um but the wax is you know the best for that um in their communications and being able and so they don't only communicate through sound they communicate mostly through pheromones and um so you know that's also hindering that that pheromone but you know if you want to do a flow hive and that feels good to you do a flow hive. If that's what gets you connected with the bees, and that's what you have, and that's how you want to work with them, th that's great. Okay, um, top bar hives. Um, these are one of my favorites. Um, these are designed, this is an, a Kenyan uh, top bar hive, and they were designed like a, a tree log. And in Africa, they will have these logs cut in half with top with bars across the top, suspended in a tree, and they will um, it just acts like a tree log. And bees love it. Um, it's horizontal. You don't have to lift heavy boxes. Um, there are no frames. You get to do crushed comb honey. This is actually the first hive I did, and. Um, this hive uh, was named after my great grandmother Rose. So it's got the rose painted on the front, and um, you can see the crystal there. And I like to put shungite in all my hives because that helps um, with um, preventing that EMF transition transmissions from coming through. Because bees are very um, sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies. And um, so you go hold up your cell phone in a beehive, they, they really don't care too much for your phone. Um, you'll see them like bumping into it. But um, so they're really sensitive to EMFs. Um, so they don't really care to be near big power stations or anything like that because it affects their, their communication as well. But with the, um, with the top bar hives, you know, you get to do crushed comb honey. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And so this is what the inside of the top bar hive looks like. 
and they have that nice half of a hexagon shape. Um, you don't end up disturbing the bees as much. There's a little bit more of a learning curve because you have to hold the frame either up and down or side to side because it, it's not doesn't have um, it's not framed all the way out, and so the wax could be warm and fall up, fall over. Um, but it teaches you how to be more gentle when you're working with bees, which is why I think it's a really great sacred beekeeping hive. And then the Layens hive, this is the one that I work most with. Um, the um, Layens hive has two inch thick lumber. Uh, it's deep boxes. It has complete frames. Um, it's well insulated. And I can put two colonies in one box with the 19 frame design. And as you can see, um, I only have a small section of the hive open. And so all those top bars, same thing in the top bar hive, are touching. Instead of like in a Langstroth, there's gaps in between each frame. And so you're only opening a small bit of the colony and it's not as um, disturbing on the bees. And, oh, here's a better picture. See, you can see when I'm working with the bees, they're, um, the top, all the top bars are touching one another. And on this top right corner, this is what you can do to transition your Langstroth to top bars by um, this little uh, jig, basically, where you just turn your top bar, your um, Langstroth frames on end. Um, but, you know, you can see here that these frames, the most they'll probably weigh will be 8 to 10 pounds. So... They're very easy to to pick up, um, much more bee friendly when you don't open up the entire roof of the hive and then the bees have to repropolize everything and that propolis is part of their immune system. So whenever you open the hive, that air in the hive is actually part of their immune system and that is released. And then you can see that blue pillowcase in there. That's full of wood chips, and that is what I use to kind of help insulate them in the winter time and also in the summer so that they can keep that much cooler. And then I really think that observation windows are in my style of sacred beekeeping. My style of sacred beekeeping is going to be different than everyone else's style because that is what sacred beekeeping is about, is developing your own style and your own relationship with the bees. So I really think that working with observation windows allows us to not have to enter the hive, but we can still see what's going on and if we need to intervene. And so you can see this nice window here allows me to see where the bees are clustering and how much honey they have and um, I can also see the bellies of the bees here and that lets me know if they're varroa mites because um, the, the varroa mites are typically on, on the abdomens of the bees. Um, you know, you'd also have to go into the brood and really see them, but if, if you're seeing them through the observation window, you know you've got a lot of varroa mites. And this is the observation window on a top bar hive of mine with the two inch thick lumber. And you can see that there are a lot of bees in this top bar hive. This is uh, this hive is doing really well. This is my oldest colony. Okay, and so I think that um, sourcing bees is really important to think about when we're thinking about sacred beekeeping. A question here: Do the mites limit how much wax the bees can make? Well, yes, because the mites are going to um, lower the bees' immune system and also lower the number of bees. And the bees will only produce wax about 10 days out of their life. They can actually regenerate these wax glands any point throughout their life. But most of the time, they're only making them 10 days out of their lives. And if they don't have good numbers and uh, or lots of bees, and if they're, you know, sick... And not feeling well and not bringing in enough honey because when in order to make wax they have to eat a lot of honey and um, that's why people really like to do the Langstroth hives with foundation because um, the bees are actually eating a lot of honey to be able to produce that wax so yeah that's a great question when um, 
when the bees have a high mite load, they're not producing as much wax. Um, so the sourcing of the bees, I really like to do bait hives. And you can see my really sweet husband there on his birthday at night um, bringing down a box of bees that was caught. And, um, you know, this is basically just a, a hive that is, you can put in a tree. They usually like to be about 10 to 15 feet up in a tree. And, you know, you can go back later and check it. Um, it's best to either use like a Langstroth deep hive or um, build your own um, swarm trap or bait hive. And um, you can, and the reason for that is because you're going to have frames already in there. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's good to put like one frame of uh, comb in there. But the bees really want that empty space because like we were talking about when bees have when bees are swarming, they've gorged themselves on honey, and so they are ready to to produce wax. And when they produce wax, they want this empty space. So it's important to have empty space in there. But if you're using a five-gallon bucket, which is the perfect amount of space and what the bees are looking for, you've got to be checking that trap pretty much daily because they are going to quickly build comb. And you're going to have to cut that comb out and put it in a frame. And that comb is pretty weak when it's first started because they haven't really put a lot of propolis in it yet. And so really even just by touching it, it will, you know, kind of melt in your fingers a bit. Um, so um, I have some sources on my website. If you go to resources and bee resources, you can find um, some instructions on how to make your own bait hives. Or if you just search it through YouTube, you, I mean, like I said, you can buy some bait hives. You can use a five gallon bucket with some um, lemongrass essential oil in a, a medicine bottle with a cotton ball, you know, three drops with some holes punched in it. And um, it'll slow release. Um, but I really think that swarms are probably your best bet because it's free. Um, you can get on local swarm lists, um, let your beekeepers associate, local beekeepers association know that you want to, um, you want, you're looking for swarms. You can put an ad in the newspaper, you can call your local pest control, fire department, um, police department, um, animal control and tell them, you know, that you're looking for swarms. And then your next best thing would be to, um, find local beekeepers who are selling nucleus hives and a nucleus hive is a it has a queen it has a it has baby bees and the queen is mated usually and um it has baby bees it has pollen and it has honey so it has the nucleus the everything that the that the hive needs to survive and um, usually they, those can range anywhere from 150 to $300, depending on the genetics of the bee and where you are. Um, and I always look for, um, treatment-free beekeepers. If anyone is interested in Mississippi, um, I really love Red Belly Bee Farms. Um, Bob Russell is amazing and he, um, was just I kind of got bullied a little bit at a beekeepers meeting because of my you know alternative style of beekeeping and after the meeting he came up to me and was like I'm glad to help you anyway I'm treatment free and he was just so nice but he is a great source to get bees from in Mississippi but you know you can also um, there are Facebook groups treatment free Facebook groups or if you don't want to go treatment free you know it's still good to buy treatment free bees if you can find them because you know they're more adapted to the um, you know issues of pests and disease um, but you know looking for hygienic bees is a really good one hygienic just means they are going to groom um, Varroa mites off of themselves. Oh, I think somebody needs to mute themselves. Oh, I can do it. I think. Yep, I did it. All right. I'm learning the same thing. Okay. And then um, your next option will be splits. And that's basically when you have another, either you have your own bees 
and you see queen cells in your hive and then you can basically divide your hive into two hives and make sure that there are either a queen or queen cells in both hives and that's a whole other class doing splits but um yeah so um i love catching swarms if you follow me on instagram you will see just how much i love swarms i this time of year, I call myself a bee midwife because I'm always getting calls to come catch swarms and um, got two calls last week, just one this week. It's kind of starting to slow down a little bit, but I had six in one week, which was the most I had ever gotten before. Um, and one, one thing that I really suggest is that when you have a bee yard and you have, you know, a hive or two or more that you either tie a, a rag to a tree or a burlap sack or something about 10 to 15 feet up if you're not going to put a bait hive out and put a few drops of lemongrass essential oil in that and usually if your colony swarms they'll land on that first and then you can gather them um if you're interested in learning more about that um there are things called a russian skyon sc i o n that you can look up and um, basically it's just like this three poles with a burlap sack over it and a little um, hood basically to keep it out of the rain but um, I like to catch my own bees because I know they're healthy um, and you know healthy colonies are typically the ones swarming and I, the reason I like to catch my own swarms is because it gives them that break in the brood cycle where the the varroa mite is feeding off of the baby bee so if there's a break where the queen leaves and she can't lay eggs again till there's comb for her to lay eggs in then um you know that varroa mite population dies down and then the hive where she swarmed Child. from has an unmated queen and there will be at least a two-week period where no eggs are being laid and um so in throughout history throughout many different cultures swarms were believed to be messengers from the dead and or from past loved ones um and so it was always said that when you when a swarm comes to you it's a message from a loved one and i have caught swarms in many people's homes and told them about this and they have said oh a loved one just passed and um, when I had to put my 14 year old lab down a couple of years back from cancer, four hours after her passing, I caught a swarm. Um, recently a friend of mine passed away and I didn't even know it. And that day I caught a swarm and a couple hours later I got a call. And so, you know, I, I do believe that they are, they're that last little, oh, I'm still with you, you know, I, I'm here watching over you sort of thing. And if you ever get to experience a swarm, it's the most magical thing in the world. The bees are so gentle because they don't have a hive to defend. And they're just flying back and forth in this, like, vortex tornado sort of thing. And, you know, you can, the Hollywood likes to make it out as this scary thing, but it's really not. I mean, you can just stand out there with your arms out and the bees won't even run into you. They won't run into each other. They are just in this, like, this vortex. And basically the bee, the, the bee is a super organism. And so when they are swarming, you know, one bee can't live alone. So when they're swarming, it is basically like they've left their body, they've disassociated, and so their energy field just expands to be as wide as the swarm, and then it contracts back into this ball that you can see on the um, top right picture. And bees always show up in swarms in the shape of a heart, like an anatomical heart, or in a yoni, as you can see on the brick wall back there. And I just think it's, you know, so beautiful because the, the yoni is like the portal to, to the living world and the heart, you know, is our, is our, our portal to life. And it's like the bees know this and they are showing us this. Okay. So I think that, you know, if we're going to talk about sacred beekeeping, that we have to see that our tools are sacred and we have to work with them or we don't have to that we can work with them in a sacred way. 
And so we we spoke a little bit about the veil earlier as being um, something that helps us designate that we're stepping in between worlds, that we're stepping into a sacred space that is something different than we've been in before. And, you know, that veil is like our protection. And if, you know, we think about donning that veil as we are going into the sacred space of the hive and that we are safe and we are protected. And, um, you know, you can either use a, a bee brush or a feather to kind of move bees or herd bees in the hive or move them off of comb, especially if you want to harvest honey. Um, and then the hive tool is kind of like our, our magic wand, our key to the hive. And if we work with that in a more a gentle, sacred way, you know, and thinking about our movements before we do them and thinking of our tools as sacred, you know, this whole process becomes a ritual and really becomes medicine just in working with the bees. And that's what I like to think about, you know, we get we get propolis as medicine, we get bee stings as medicine, we get honey as medicine, but working with the bees is medicine. It's meditation. Breathing in that hive air, it's medicine. Um, and then uh, the smoker. Um, I only use the smoker when I have to, when the bees are kind of upset. Um, you don't even really have to light the smoker. Sometimes you can just kind of puff that, that um, smoker and it'll have some of that scent. Um, but what the reason why people are um, using a smoker is because it kind of masks the pheromones, the alarm pheromones that bees put off. And if you start smelling bananas, know that that's the bee alarm pheromone. And just step back for a minute and count to, you know, 30, 60, whatever, and just give the bees a moment to like settle down. Um, but you can see these like cedar bundles that I have uh, wrapped on the bottom right here. And um, whenever I catch a swarm on a cedar tree, I um, and I have to clip the limb to get the bees down, I will make that limb, all those branches into, uh, or all that greenery into um, a smoking fuel for my hive. And, oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, yeah, if y'all have questions, put them in the chat box. I'll try to speed this up a little bit. Um, but that's another way of an offering for the bees is something that smells good and something that is, you know, gentle and loving and that I put care and intention into. And then we spoke earlier about um, using a cloth to um, cover the hive, especially if we're working with a Langstroth hive in the parts that are open. Because bees like to be in the darkness, you know. Like we said, they live between the worlds. They're in the darkness and the light. And then to glove or not to glove. Um, I really like working without gloves. It makes me more gentle. It... Um, I mean, the bees like tickle your hands when they're walking all over you and it's a whole other sensation, but I really think it makes us move so much more slowly because we don't want to get stung. Um, but bees can sense fear. And so when you're first starting out, please wear your veil, please wear your suit, please wear your gloves, please wear whatever makes you feel good. And then as you develop that relationship, then you can begin to take the gloves off. And then you might begin to only wear the veil instead of the full suit. Or you move from the full suit to the jacket to the veil. You know, whatever it is, um, just do it in your own time. And don't feel pressure to, to do something that you're not comfortable with because the bees can smell that. And you know, like we were talking about, they work through pheromone. Well, you put off that, that scent when you are afraid and they smell that. Okay, I thought a different slide was next, but I added this one in. Okay, so um, mindfully harvesting from the bees, I think, is really important when we talk about sacred beekeeping. Um, I feel very strongly that we don't take any propolis from... Propolis is this um, top left picture, that glue-looking um, substance there. That is the tree resins that the bees collect, and that is the immune system 
of the tree and then the bees mix it with their gut microbes and then they kind of form it into um, this um, covering all through the hive and that serves as their um, antimicrobial, antibacterial, antiviral um, immune system inside the hive and they coat it everywhere. And sadly, lots of bee breeders have bred out the propolis um, because it, it's hard to lift these Langstroth boxes when they've glued them all together. But I r love uh, bees that are um, producing lots of propolis. I actually scrape the insides of the walls in my hive so they're not really smooth to get the bees to produce, to put propolis over it. Because if it's smooth, they won't do that. I don't know what that means, you raised a hand. Does that mean you want to talk? Okay. Oh. It's, isn't it like bee glue? Yes, bee glue. Thank you, Charlie. Bee glue, the propolis. Yes. Is there anything else you wanted to say about the bee glue? Yeah, that was it? Okay. And um, yeah, so it's this bee glue that is um, basically holding the hive together. And um, it's important that we don't harvest the propolis on living hives, that we only take it from hives that are, um, you know, that have left or have died. And we don't take all of it still. We want to leave some of that for the next bees that will be working in that hive. And then um, honey harvesting. Uh, I only harvest in the spring. I do harvest in the fall, but the, the, only, the what I'm doing is I'm basically taking honey from hives that have a lot and spreading it out to hives that don't have so much. So I'm not actually harvesting it for myself. I'm spreading it out between other beehives. I harvest in the spring when the dandelions are in full bloom and nectar flow is coming into the hive. And the reason why I do that is because I want to make sure that the bees have honey all winter long. I don't feed my bees. Um, I do make them bee tea, which is like honey mixed with water and um, a couple of different herbs that help strengthen their immune system when I notice that a hive is more weaker. But um, I only harvest in the spring and I will still only take from the hives that have enough to take some from and I'll still make sure that that honey is spread through the other hives before I take any. And then I use a press and this is actually a fruit press. You can use a tincture press. And the reason why I use a press is because we're getting more of that propolis and um, pollen and it makes that honey way more medicinal, way more flavorful and you can it just really brings out the bouquet of the the honey you know there's honey sommeliers just as there are wine sommeliers like honey gets better with age and its scents get stronger and it was really cool because at the conference people were smelling and tasting the honey and they were saying oh I smell this and I was like well that was near my beehive and so you know I, I really believe that um you know honey presses are where it's at and we talked a little bit about, you know, medicine of the bees through the five senses. You know, bees, um, people have worked with the hum like we did in the beginning for sound healing. Um, there is a woman who's actually doing studies on playing the sounds of healthy hives to unhealthy hives. And that they are actually, just that sound frequency is bringing them into a healthier state. And then we talked about the smell, the propolis. Um... And, you know, when to harvest, when we harvest the honey, that smell of that honey, um, the taste of honey, um, the, um, the touch of the bees crawling on our fingers, the stickiness of the honey, that softness of the wax, consciously moving gently through the hive. And then the last is that, that vision, that seeing the bees dancing outside of the front of the hive in their figure eight dance, observing them throughout um, the different seasons in the front of the hive and what they're doing. 
And then um, lastly is planting. I think this is the last slide, maybe. <laughs> planting for the bees. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we're also planting for native pollinators. So planting some things that both the native pollinators and the bees um, find important. So um, it's best if we think about those early and late flowering plants because, you know, in that in-between time, there's a lot of things flowering. But, you know, those early plants are going to be like borages, crocus, clovers, coneflowers, phlox, uh, roses, blackberries, hellebore, um, maple trees are really important source of early pollen. Um, oak trees, hawthorns, redbud, poplars, buckeyes. And then those late flowering plants, um, goldenrod, borage can flower twice, um, sunflowers, broccoli, asters, marigolds, hollyhocks. And, you know, zinnias are really good for that long summer um, flow. And then, you know, we've talked several times about treatment-free, and, you know, I'm a treatment-free beekeeper. It's not for everyone. Um, I understand that. If you're interested in treatment-free or Darwinian-style beekeeping, you can read some of Thomas Seeley's work. But, you know, when we say treatment-free, we are still allowing practices to happen that are treatments in their own way, like allowing for swarming. Um, and then when you're treatment-free, you're going to lose some hives, and it's sad, but... And I cry every time it happens, but, you know, it's also a lesson in that, you know, um, the, the stronger um, hives are going to survive and make the next generations of bees more strong and more healthy. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, um, to wrap it up just a bit, you know, I do uh, mentorships, virtual and in-person, monthly bee meetings, hive hostings if you're local, in-person and virtual tours. Um, you can sponsor some of my beehives, and I do ceremony and ritual. And if you found this um, to be something that you enjoyed, I really appreciate donations. Um, they really help keep me going. And I'm trying to get, oh, stop share screen. And, you know, I really appreciate them. So um, what do I use to protect the bees from electromagnetic frequencies? Um, shungite, shungite stone, and um, you can get that on Etsy. Uh, black tourmaline does the same thing. Um, and I just put shungite in every hive. And from what I've read, it doesn't have to be a huge piece of shungite. Um, even the small pieces work. So I just order bulk bags of shungite and um, put them in in every single hive. Um, any more questions y'all have, just put them in the chat. I'm gonna go through a few of my favorite books. Um, so The Song of Increase by Jacqueline Freeman is a really great um, sacred beekeeping type book. And then of course The Sacred Bee, which is a well-worn book of mine by Hilda Ransom. And this one I've mentioned many times at the Hive Entrance by H. Storch. And this one teaches you about what's going on in the hive. On one side of the page, it will show you um, an observation. And on the other side of the page, it'll tell you what's, what's happening in the hive. And um, I really like Gunter Hawk's work. Um, he runs the um, Spike Nard Honeybee Sanctuary in Virginia towards saving the bee. Are y'all seeing this backwards, I guess? Maybe. Um, <laughs> Toward Saving the Bee, Gunter Hawk. Um, and then, I really think if you want to be a sacred beekeeper, you really need to know about how bees um, live and how they function. And so, The Buzz About Bees, The Biology of a Superorganism is a really good one. Um, and I'm not going to... Jürgen Touts. And these are all on my website under Bee Book Resources. Oh, it's not backwards. Good. Okay, it just looks backwards on my computer then. Um, and then Thomas Seeley, The Life of Bees. Any of Thomas Seeley's work, he's got lots of great um, YouTube videos. And, yeah, so any questions? I had to kind of cut that short, but there's so much to talk about sacred beekeeping. Um, but, yes, if you have any questions, um, now will be the time. But you can also email me. If you have questions and um, I'm always you know trying to look for new topics that are exciting to everyone 
So, you know, if you have a topic that you're interested in, please, um, please let me know. I, uh, yeah, love to hear from you. Love to hear about what you are looking for.